Um, now, um, I'm just going to, in this lecture, introduce the overall setup and try and motivate the need for considering different voting mechanisms because at the outset it seems like certain obvious choices should just work. So why are we breaking our heads over, you know, um, uh, figuring out who should win an election, which is kind of the setting that, that we will be exploring in some depth. Um, the sessions tomorrow will delve deeper into specific sort of themes and I'll give a high level introduction to all of them now. So this lecture will not be so much proofs as it will be concepts, definitions and just examples, yeah. And um, in the next lecture we will probably take, uh, take a bit of a break just to talk about some generic game theoretic concepts. Uh, by actually playing uh, a game. So we'll put ourselves in a situation and ask ourselves what would we do. So again, it's more of an intuitive uh, playing field. Uh, so that's kind of the plan for today afternoon. So let me just get started with voting, uh, where I'll begin by describing the general setup. Uh, you are welcome to think of a political election as a running example at the back of your minds because that's probably the most intuitive example uh, but I also want to call out the fact that that's not the only situation in which these mechanisms are applicable. Uh, any situation where you have a bunch of people who are trying to decide something uh, and you have to choose a small number of alternatives from a large pool of potential possibilities voting mechanisms and the theory of voting would be applicable. So this could be all of you trying to figure out uh, where should you go for dinner tonight, what cuisine, or which film do you want to watch over the weekend. Different people have different tastes and you want to somehow arrive at a decision where, I don't know, perhaps nobody is too unhappy or everybody is happy depending on whether you are a pessimist or an optimist, that, that, that would be your sort of goal, right? Um, Think of uh, the Oscars committee trying to figure out which films should win, uh, you know, the various awards or an airline trying to figure out which movies it should put on its entertainment system on board which has limited space. Uh, variety of situations, uh, all of the things that we are going to discuss would be applicable but political elections is uh, is, is a fairly significant, pertinent application, one that all of us are familiar with. So, uh, so a lot of our terminology will also be inspired by that setting. So we'll talk of candidates and voters and things like that. All I want to say is that just because of the terminology, uh, don't limit uh, the extent to which these ideas can be applied. Okay. So having said that, let's just say that this is the situation we are looking at is that you have a bunch of voters and you have a bunch of alternatives. Mathematically, you can think of these as fixed, finite and disjoint sets, although there will be situations where these sets need not even be disjoint. So it could be that the voters are the alternatives and they're voting amongst each other, about each other. You could be in such a situation but that's not one that we will encounter. So to keep things simple, I'm just going to assume that the set of voters is distinct from the set of alternatives. And uh, the main component of the input is that voters uh, express preferences. Over these alternatives, yeah. So that's kind of what we are doing. Um, the question is what do we mean by preferences and how can these preferences be expressed, right? So let's say, um, let's say we have three candidates, I'm going to be, I just want to make sure that, so if something is not legible or if I have a bad habit of picking really esoteric colors, so if something doesn't show up well on the projector, please let me know. So suppose we have three alternatives, I'm going to be unimaginative and call them ABC, but this could be 
um, I don't know, Indian, Italian, or Chinese for dinner. You know, think of your favorite example at the back of your mind. How do you think you would like to express uh, your preferences over these alternatives? What are what is a natural way of capturing them? You have already seen one way so far. We talked about students expressing preferences over programs, for instance, or residents expressing preferences over hospitals, or applications, applicants expressing preferences over posts. So how were those preferences expressed? So what was the what what was the input to some of these matching matching problems, for instance? A list. Okay. So I'm going to call that a ranking. That's so, so one notion of preferences could be rankings, which are just ordered lists over the alternatives, and these lists could be complete or incomplete, depending on the situation. This is also something that you have seen, we have spoken about how when there are a large number of alternatives, as in the situation with college admissions, where the number of programs is huge, you cannot reasonably expect students to rank everything. So they will probably indicate their top 10 or top 15 preferences, sometimes more, but Essentially, not everything is ranked. You give your top uh, K choices. Are there other ways in which you can express preferences? In our Indian elections, how do we express preferences? So if you, if you go out to vote, right, what, is a, what, what, is, what does the ballot look like? What is your vote? Sorry? Um, so I'm not sure I caught that, so I'm going to ask you to repeat. Right. Oh, characteristics of candidates, is that what you said? Yeah, so that is the basis, okay, so that is getting into uh, the basis on which you form your opinion or you, um, your preferences are determined based on various factors, right? So in a marriage problem, you may be looking at uh, various facets which are typically enlisted in these matrimonial advertisements. So that may form the basis of the ranking. Uh, in a political election, it may be, you know, the contributions of the candidates in the past or the reputation of the parties involved or whatever. So those would be, so it won't be just by the names. Sure, I agree. But uh, my question is uh, more about what is what is it that you submit to the central authority, right? So we've been talking about the authority that runs the Gale Shapley algorithm, for instance. So they run it on a bunch of rankings. Uh, the Indian Election Commission processes a collection of votes, which are essentially what? They are, are they rankings? Or do you rank all the candidates? You don't get an opportunity to do that. So what do you do instead? Right, so you just select, uh, so you have sometimes all you get to specify is your top candidate, right? So if you are an impatient group of friends trying to quickly figure out where to go for dinner, you're not going to say, Ki, you know, I prefer pizza over South Indian, over Chinese, over, you just say, Ka jana hai, where do you want to go? And you get one option. And then you try to decide based on that. So that could be another way of expressing uh, preferences. Can you think of any other ways in which people may express their preferences? Yeah. Right. Right. So based on how many seats are available, so I think you're already preempting something that I'm going to come to very shortly, which is the issue of what is it that we want to output. Right now we are talking about what are what what is the nature of the input, but there's also what is the goal here. I haven't really addressed that. Um, so implicitly perhaps we are thinking that the goal is to select a winning alternative. That is the place that you decide to go to for dinner, 
or the the person that's going to you know lead the nation uh, for a five year term so so there is a notion of a winner that's probably already implicit in your minds but there could be situations where it's not just one winner maybe you're uh, you know uh, at uh, at an apartment, there, there's housing society election, so they have to pick a committee of typically 10 people. Somebody is the chair, somebody is the treasurer, somebody looks after security, somebody looks after something else, maintenance, etc. So you're trying to pick a group of 10 people who can run the show. So you have, in this case, a concept of multiple winners. And even in political elections, you have a concept of people representing you in some sort of a parliament, so you're trying to really elect multiple people. And um, and if you're really picky about your uh, taste in food, then you may decide to split up into two groups and go your separate ways. So maybe there are two restaurants that get picked by the group and you know you, you just decide to go to two different places. So there could be scenarios where there are multiple alternatives that get chosen, in which case it may be natural to say that people uh, you know, vote for not one person, but perhaps if, if you want to select 10 people, then maybe you vote for 10 people. That's your, in your head, that's the ideal committee and that's what you're voting for, right? So I'm just going to generalize that a little bit to say that, to just account for a few other possibilities and in general say that you could express your preferences as what is called an approval ballot, which is a little more general than just giving your top candidate. Uh, here, essentially for every, for every option, it's like a yay or nay. So you say, well, is this, is, am I okay with this alternative or am I not okay with this alternative? So these are just binary preferences. For every alternative, you give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, okay? And you could also, I mean, um, some people generalize this to a three-way ballot where you have the option of saying that you really like somebody or that you really dislike somebody or that you are neutral about somebody. So you could, you could do that as well. So the difference between rankings and approval ballots is that in rankings you're inherently making a lot of pairwise comparisons in your head because it's all about saying that you prefer this person over this person or this alternative over that alternative and so on. Whereas in approval ballots it's very specific to the uh, individual alternative whom you are just evaluating on their own merit. So it's either that this person is cool and this person is not cool. So that's, um, that's, that's the sort of situation. And there are other ways in which you could do this. So incomplete rankings, we are really thinking about truncated rankings here, but there are other ways in which rankings could be in some sense incomplete. Uh, for instance, a lot of people like to study partial orders or weak orders which are, um, so weak orders are easier to explain. They're essentially rankings where you allow for ties. So you say that you're allowed to say that you are indifferent between certain candidates. Uh, partial orders are even more general and so on and so forth. So I don't want to get into too many details at this stage. I just wanted to allude to the fact that preferences can be expressed in a number of ways. And for now, we will continue to focus on rankings because that's what we have looked at. But tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit also about approval ballots. And that is uh, because that's also an interesting and slightly different situation. Um, what do we want uh, from the system? This is the input. You have voters and alternatives, and you have every voter expressing preferences over alternatives. What do you want as the output? We have already discussed this. So it could be either that you want a single winner or that you want to elect a committee. Is there anything else that you could possibly want? So you might even want a ranking of all the alternatives, which is sort of a reflection of the societal opinion of all the alternatives. So you might want the system to output a ranking which reflects the, you know, so not only the top candidate or the top 10 candidates, but essentially a complete ranking of all the candidates. So that's, uh, that's the sort of thing that you could be seeking. Uh, so let me just say that the goal is, So the goal is to find a winning alternative, um, but keep in mind that it could also be a committee or a ranking.
And again, we'll just stick to the problem of finding winners. Although there is a bit of an issue with regards to ties. So you may be in a situation where the only natural thing is to just output everybody as a winner because everyone's doing equally well. And I think we'll just discuss that in a little more detail now. So as I said, let's just fix our situation uh, as rankings. So the input is a bunch of rankings over alternatives and the goal is to find a winner. Okay. Keeping in mind that there could be various other scenarios, but we'll just focus on this. Okay, so let's say that there are again, as I said, maybe three options that we are considering. Um, now, let's suppose that A is the most popular option in some sense. Let's say that A gets five votes and B and C get three and four votes each, okay. These alternatives could, um, yeah, again, they could reflect a variety of situations. Let's assume that this is something that is serious, maybe, uh, maybe it's some judicial setting. So I'm sort of following here the handbook of computational social choice. So in terms of reference, most of this will be based on the first and second chapters. So most of the examples are also drawn from there. So in the handbook, um, the specific example they're considering is determining the fate of, uh, Prisoners, I don't know why it's always so morbid. So A is, I think, uh, some sort of a, let's say, death penalty, and then B is letting them go free, and, and C is some maybe interim um, uh, interim outcome, okay? So, uh, so you are in, I think, uh, some sort of a Roman Empire quite some time ago, and they're trying to figure out what to do, and this is a Senate which has voted like this. So. So five people are in favor of uh, sort of a violent outcome and then B and C are, you know, there, there are three and four people voting for these alternative outcomes in the Senate. What do you think is a good choice of what the outcome should be? So here there can only be one fate for the prisoner or prisoners in question. So there is no, no possibility of choosing two outcomes or more. So you really have to declare a solution so what would you do in this context? How many of you would say we should go with A? Okay. Considering that's the most popular option, so, okay, all right. So it's at least somebody rooting for A. So maybe let's even make it a little more tight and say, this is 533. Three. Why would you say that A is a reasonable choice and why would you say that A is not a reasonable choice? So I'm kind of cheating a bit and only showing you the top options here rather than showing you the full rankings, but it's still enough to drive a discussion. So let's, let's still talk about this. Okay, so pros of choosing A as the winner. Okay, so nobody seems to like A, so why would you not want to choose A as the winner? Okay, we don't know the entire ranking, so we don't have enough inputs to make up our minds. That's a fair point. And we will get to examples which do have rankings. But suppose, um, uh, just, just for a moment, suppose that uh, this is one of those situations where everyone is only submitting their top candidate, although I promised you that we'll be focusing on rankings. Let's just say that folks are focused on their top candidate. And that's all, that, that's all the information that you have to wrestle with. Um, is there a clear concept of who, who, what's a good outcome? 
it's not a clear majority, it's not more than 50%, uh, and therefore, uh, in some sense, uh, yeah, so, so B, uh, B and C together have six votes, right? And that, that makes it, um, so this is, So, uh, so A is what you would call a plurality winner, but not a majority winner. By plurality, we just mean that that's, A is the most popular option. It has gotten the maximum number of votes. But the plurality winner could also easily be the least popular person in the sense that, again, it's a small exercise to complete these two rankings in such a way that you could have the six people who have voted for B and C probably have A as their last option, which means that a majority of people actually prefer A the least, right? So even though it is the most popular option, in some sense, it's also the least desirable option. So that's why the plurality winner in this case would not be a good idea. And in particular, I mean, if you were using the plurality voting rule, there could also be, so the story goes that somebody decided to knock out option C, probably somebody with some power in the Senate said, let's not consider it. And assuming that the, vote, the voters who voted for B and C actually had A as their least favorite option, when you don't have the option of C, then you are, you are going to go to your next favorite option, which is going to be option B. In which case, by simply deleting the option, you have deleting one of the alternatives, you have actually flipped the outcome of the election. Okay, so is that clear? I mean, if if you are, if you are fixated on picking the most popular uh, candidate, then uh, the the whole procedure is subject to this this kind of it's vulnerable to this sort of thing, where by deleting a candidate, you can actually influence the outcome of the election. Yeah. Okay, so this is one of the things that we will look at more closely tomorrow. This is called control by deleting candidates. Um, it's a fairly practical problem uh, where you try to influence the outcome of, uh, of a particular um, voting setup by trying to eliminate um, uh, alternatives. And there's also analogously control by deleting voters. So all of this sounds very morbid, but I think uh, it, it leads to some really interesting scenarios and some interesting math. So we'll be looking at this a little bit more. Uh, but I'll also draw your attention to something that, a uh, phenomenon that you've already seen in the context of matching, which is cheating, uh, where voters basically uh, may be tempted to cheat about, about their preferences. So we'll come to that in just a bit, but in the meantime, Let's just, let's just talk about, I mean, clearly plurality is not, it's, I mean, it's, it's clear that that's, that has issues. So let's think about what are other possibilities or what are other ways of picking winners that might be reasonable. So I just want to prompt ideas for, um, you know, for other mechanisms for picking winners. So now let's move to working with rankings. So again, this is, one of the examples from the book, so I'll just explain the notation in a second. This means that the ranking A over B over C is submitted by 102 voters, okay? 101 voters submit B over C over A. All right. So is the notation clear? So 102 voters prefer A over B over C, 101 of them prefer B over C over A, and 100 voters prefer C over B over A. So all distinct rankings. And So you look at plurality, what is the, who is the winner? Plurality would be A. Um, again, this is a situation where the plurality winner is the least preferred outcome uh, in terms of the remaining 201 voters really liking it the least. 
So we don't like plurality. So we are going to do, uh, we're going to try and imagine more sophisticated ways of choosing winners. Uh, are there any, are there any suggestions? So, yeah, so B is in the top two for all voters, which means that you don't make anyone terribly unhappy. Um, so what is, okay, so, so it, certainly in this specific example, B seems like a good choice. Can we think of formalizing a mechanism which actually makes B win based on this idea? So clearly the main issue with plurality is that it is not considering, um, it's not considering anything beyond the top vote. So since it is not even taking that information into account, it cannot take advantage of any of the other information. So we need to, this motivates the need for mechanisms that actually dig deeper into the rankings and actually use all that extra information that is there. So, so how, how do you think we might come up with a voting rule or a mechanism um, which actually accounts for this additional information? Right. Right. So one natural thing to do is to maybe give points to the candidates based on where they are ranked by the voters, right? So for instance, you pointed out already, B is ranked at position one by 101 voters and at position two by 202 voters, right? And similarly, this is A situation. This is C situation, which, I mean, yeah, so something like 1, 2, and 3 may not have been bad if, uh, for example, if the last bundle had a higher weight, then C may have even um, come out on top. But in this case, intuitively, we do see that B is doing well. How do we, how do we formalize this? So let's say that... Um, So is this a reasonable proposal? Maybe we just give scores of 0, 1, and 2 based on the ranks, yeah? So if a voter ranks you third, you get nothing from that voter. If a voter ranks you second, you get one point. And if a voter ranks you on the top, then you get two points. It's kind of weighted based on, based on where you are. And um, i let you work out what the scores will be, but um, But B emerges as the winner if, if this, is, this is what you use. Um, so this is a special case of a wide class of voting rules called scoring rules, where you can imagine that the 0, 1, 2 vector can be adapted in different ways, possibly leading to different outcomes. And again, we will have more to say about scoring rules later. But essentially, if you give me a score vector, you have a scoring rule, right? So it could be that you want your scores to be minus two, zero, plus two, for instance. Like you want to heavily penalize being ranked last and you want to heavily reward being ranked on the top. And uh, Beechka is a neutral stance, so you give zero points for being ranked in the middle. That could be another way of looking at it. Plurality is a special case of a scoring rule where the scoring vector is, what is zero, zero, one. And if you've heard of terms like veto, veto is another scoring rule where um, essentially it's a flipped scoring vector. You give one for everything other than being ranked at the bottom. And if you're ranked at the bottom, you get zero. So that's kind of the opposite of plurality. So, um, and there are also other, so for instance, you could also do a thresholded version of plurality where you could say that 
you fix a threshold k and if you make it in the top k positions for some voter then you get one point and if you fall below the top k then you get zero right so it's a kind of generalized plurality where you are accounting at least a little bit for the rest of the ranking right so plurality so that's called k approval and plurality is essentially k approval with k is equal to 1 so this is one class of voting rules and i'm going to let you think about potential issues with this sort of a score vector this is called the boda this is called the boda scoring rule And as I said, going the score vector route gives you a whole class of voting rules called scoring rules. But let's also think about um, another way of looking at elections, which is pairwise majority rules. And here what we want to do is essentially have the candidates face off against each other yeah and engage in these pairwise battles like you would do in maybe a sports competition right so um, in this case if we have a pairwise election between these candidates who would win or lose. So notice that we have an odd number of voters. So um, there would be, this is very similar to uh, the sort of situation we had with popular matchings where you basically ask the voters which candidate do you prefer. So the number of voters who prefer A over B versus the number of voters who prefer B over A, that's what you want to analyze when you're doing the pairwise contest between A and B, right? So what are we looking at here? So uh, between A and B, who wins between A and B? So I just want you to focus. So how many voters prefer A over B? So 102 voters that prefer A over B and all the remaining voters prefer B over A, right? So between A and B, I would say that B wins this pairwise election, yes? Uh, between B and C, so let's just focus on B and C. Who is winning? Okay, so okay, so I want to illustrate okay, so between B and C also B is winning. I do want to be sure about this though, yeah, okay. Um, what about between A and C? C is winning. Fine, so, um, so in this setting, uh, we see that B again seems like a natural choice given the fact that it's winning two of the, uh, it's winning the two pairwise elections that it participates in. Right. Okay, so one sort of okay concept could be that you So you beat every other candidate in a pairwise contest. That would be, if a candidate does this, 
then it seems very reasonable to choose this candidate as the winning candidate. And notice that in this example, this is different from the plurality candidate, right? So this is a so-called Condorcet winner. Um, is there a problem with this definition or do you perceive any issues with the concept of a condor seven. So is the is the is the definition clear? You run pairwise contests between all pairs of candidates, right? And somebody who beats everyone else in their pairwise contests. So for a pairwise contest, you essentially project the election on those two candidates and basically look at their performance, right? And essentially if somebody wins all of these pairwise contests, then that seems like a pretty strong contender for winning the election. Yes? So, is there a problem with this? In this pairwise majority graph, that's a good point. So, if you drew this graph where you have an edge from a candidate A to a candidate B, from A to B, if B defeats A in the pairwise contest. So this is called the pairwise majority graph, although sometimes people like to make this a weighted graph where you label the edges with the margin of victory, like by how many votes did I win. So you may want to keep track of those numbers as well, but for now I'm just keeping it simple. And this is also going to be a complete graph because you can, you will have the pairwise contest between every pair of candidates. So it's going to be a complete directed graph, which is also called a tournament. And again, this is something that we will come back to later. Uh, but in this graph, if a candidate has no outgoing edges, that would mean that they were not defeated at all. And that's what we are going to call, that's the candidate that, that we will call a Condorcet winner. And is there any reason that this notion is problematic? I asked you the same thing about Boda, but I skipped ahead. Uh, because the issue here is a little more transparent than the issue with Boda. Uh, I mean, every, every voting rule that you come up with is going to have pros and cons, and that's, that's the sort of thing that we want to think about. Uh, so that, I mean, the overall agenda is that in a particular situation, you want to be able to figure out what is a good mechanism to apply, right? And for that, it's good to have an understanding of what are the pros and cons of the various mechanisms that you can come up with so that you can figure out what is, what is the best, um, what's the best deal for a given situation. Yeah, so that's kind of the overall agenda. Um, can you think of an example, can you come up with an election where there are no Condorcet winners, can that happen? Yes? Okay, can somebody quickly give me an example, maybe even by modifying this one, but yeah, so yeah, the graph will look like a cycle, but what I want is the numbers that make that graph feasible. So what, what do I want? So if you have a cycle, you don't have Condorcet winners. So this is a situation where you don't have any Condorcet winner, that's a graph. What would be, what would be an election that produces this graph? equal number of uh, votes in which each candidate wins or is on the top or something like that. Yeah, so I mean maybe you're looking for some sort of symmetry I suppose. So you want, um, so let's say in this case I want B to beat A in pairwise elections. So let's just say we have uh, one vote of each kind, right? So here, so let me just rotate this a bit.
Sorry? Okay, uh, so this by itself does not work. Yeah, let's just double check. So this is this is okay. You think this will work? I, yeah, so let's just check. So B beats A in the first two columns, right? And so that's, so B defeats A. I want A to defeat C. Um, I see, so here C is defeating A, so that's why you wanted, you wanted me to switch this out. Is that what you were saying? A defeats C. So I want A to defeat C. So um, so A defeats C in the first and the last column. Uh, and I also want B to defeat, I want B to defeat C and that is happening in the first two columns. Yeah. So that is a situation where a Condorcet winner does not even exist. And this is called a majority cycle. which is quite interesting because it sort of emerged from acyclic preferences. We always assume that individual preferences are rational and acyclic, that you have a clear ranking and you don't say things like I prefer A over B, B over C and then C over A, which would be slightly crazy because uh, I mean most, most rational preferences are transitive, although there could be um, there could be settings where even an individual preference may, may be cyclic because it's possible that the evaluation is happening based on different dimensions. So maybe there's a context in which you prefer A over B and B over C. And maybe when you are being asked about C over A, if the context has changed, then maybe you could still go the other way. So there are people who do study, uh, you know, cyclic preferences. But again, that is something we won't really go into. So for us, preferences are always rational, which is to say that they, they are acyclic. But by combining a bunch of acyclic preferences, we have somehow ended up with a, with a societal preference that is not rational. And majority cycles are a fairly fundamental philosophical issue in voting. And a lot of work has been prompted by the existence of majority cycles and trying to understand what are reasonable ways of dealing with them. I mean, technically a voting rule could just say that I'm going to declare a three-way tie between these candidates, for instance. Assuming, so this could be a majority cycle that's embedded in a larger election where it's conceivable that these three candidates are dominating everyone else and all the remaining edges are outgoing, but there is a cycle between these three, in which case it may seem reasonable to say that, that there is a three-way tie and you figure out how you want to resolve it. Uh, and that is, that is one, one way to do it, but as we will see, there are other ways of, in some sense, breaking these cycles or trying to figure out, um, you know, what's the way of dealing with it. But that's one of the issues with just talking about Condorcet winners is that you may end up with fairly large tied classes. So these cycles could be much longer, in which case uh, it becomes a serious issue. Um, you could, however, ask for any voting mechanism that you come up with to be Condorcet consistent, which means that in the presence of majority cycles, the voting rule is allowed to do whatever. But if you don't have majority cycles, then whatever outcome you come up with must be the Condorcet winner. So when you come up with your own voting mechanism, a nice property to check for is, is it Condorcet consistent? Yeah. Um, and that's a good exercise to, you know, to sort of validate for many of the voting rules that we will see. Is it Condorcet consistent? Okay. Um, one thing here that I've already mentioned is that we haven't really accounted for um, the margins of victory while talking about the majority graph. So let's do that now. Um, so I'm going to define this quantity.
so so what is this expression here so the this notation here is basically uh, the it's the notation for the preference of the jth voter and it's saying that the jth voter prefers a over b okay so so n is the set of voters a is the set of alternatives so the first expression is counting what So right, that's the number of voters who prefer A over B. And this is the number of voters who prefer B over A. So I'm going to define the so-called Boda count. So the net of A over B is just the, if, if A is defeating B in the pairwise election between A and B, then you can think of net of A over B as essentially the margin of victory, right? By how many votes, I mean, what is the gap? How many more voters prefer A over B to B over A? And if A is losing, then it's pretty much the same margin but with a negative sign, right? So because A is losing, so it's the same thing. So the Boda count for a candidate X, so this is sometimes called the symmetric Boda score to distinguish it from the scoring based Boda. So this is just the sum of the net battles. So essentially I'm running A, I mean I'm pitting A against all the remaining alternatives and I'm picking up its margins of victory, I mean margins of victory or defeat depending on the situation and I'm adding it all up. So this is the board account for the candidate A and the again this is essentially assigning a number to every candidate and the, the person who comes out on top is the person with the highest score. Um, is there a connection between the Boda count and the Boda score, the Boda, the score based Boda voting rule that we saw before, which is here. So let me just pull out this definition and place it there. So remember that the net is just the um, margins of victory between A and B. Is there is there any similarity that you see between these two things? So we are assigning we are assigning scores based on positions in uh, in the Boda scoring rule. In the Boda counting rule, we are doing this based on pairwise. Um, pairwise contests, right? Is there any uh, anything that's sort of common? Okay, so there is a relationship between these two quantities and uh, let me just at least try and convey some intuition. Um, so when we are giving two points to A for every uh, voter that ranks A on the top, right? So these are, if you think of the pairwise majority graph, so if you look at, if you look at A in the pairwise majority graph, it has these edges to B and C. 
right? And we are thinking of the net of A over B is the number of voters who prefer A over B minus the number of voters who prefer B over A. So at least the number of voters who prefer A over B, that is essentially this arrow here and this 102 here. So you did give one point for that. And you gave another point for, so you gave two points, right? Because its position was two and you gave two points. You can think of those two points as being distributed over one point for defeating B and one point for defeating C, okay? If you are, if you had a bigger ranking and somebody is in the third position over, let's say, 10 candidates, if you are ranked third, that means you are defeating seven other candidates and that's, so the score that you are getting can be thought of as one point for each candidate that you defeat. And that plays into the net score, although in the net score you are counting it differently. I mean, um, here you are counting it per voter, so the scores across two edges are kind of getting clubbed in these two points, right? So I think that's, um, so, so the, so from the net score, the first component, which is the number of voters who prefer A over B, that is being accounted for by the BODA score. What is not being accounted for in the scoring version is the remaining amount, which is in some sense the loss. But if you add up the losses, you will see that, okay, so uh, the wins and the losses add up to the total number of voters, right? Because that's just how many voters there are. So if you write it out a bit, you will see that the BODA count is essentially related to the BODA by a factor of plus n. And because of some uh, overcounting that happens, there is a factor of 2 as well. So I'll write down the precise relationship in the case of three candidates. Um, and maybe you can think about how to prove it. It is not, uh, it is not difficult at all. And we can, I mean, I just see that I don't have enough time left, but we can look at it, it's, this, it's the sort of thing that's nice to work out over a tutorial as well. So, so the symmetric BODA score for a candidate A, so this is how I'm going to put it and I'm going to leave this as an exercise for now. So this symmetric one is the, so I always get confused. So the asymmetric one is the one based on the scoring vector and the symmetric one is based on the pairwise majority elections and the margins of victory and defeat. Sorry? N is the total number of voters. Thanks. So I think in general, this 2 is going to be number of candidates minus 1, but I'm just going to say uh, on an election with 3 candidates because it's just a little less messy to see. So there's a voting rule that's based on the pairwise majority graph that's even simpler than the, uh, that's even simpler than BODA count in the sense that we don't even worry so much about the margins. So I'm going to define for you the Copeland score of a candidate, but before I do that, I don't know, maybe I want to ask you if there is, so if I just give you the pairwise majority graph, okay, which is this object that we saw here without the margins. So, I mean, I can build this graph based on the election and let's say we lost the election to some computer crash, the election data is gone, but you somehow have the graph. So you don't have the data on the margins, but you just have the graph. So apart from talking about the Condorcet winner, which has the problem that it may not exist, uh, what, is, what is another natural way of 
defining a winner based on based on this pairwise majority graph. So you have information about who won the pairwise contests, right? What would you uh, what would you try and parse out of this? So if you focus your attention on, so maybe let me just draw an abstract tournament. So I'm just making this up on the fly, sorry. So here maybe we have a majority cycle. So there is no Condorcet winner because here you have a majority cycle and the other candidate is getting defeated at least once. So so if you focus your attention on a particular candidate, what is it, how, how would you like to summarize the performance of this candidate? in this election. So this candidate here right on top. Right. It loses one and wins two. That's the kind of information that you want to perhaps add to your summary. So, so it lost one. Sorry, yeah, it uh, it lost to D and it won against B and C, right? So, oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, so the convention is that the arrow is from A to B if A is winning. So sorry. So uh, so A wins against B, wins against C, and loses to D. Is that a fair summary? Okay, so my convention is that I put an arrow from x to y if x wins. So have I flipped the convention? So here for instance, Okay, but let me just make sure that here at least it's consistent. So here we have said that this is an arrow going from B to A and indeed, um, okay, so I think I have flipped my convention, sorry, in both cases. So at least it was consistent so far. Um, all right, so maybe let me try to keep it consistent at least within this discussion, but I'm afraid I may have spoiled your habit because it's, I think, at least in the book, I believe it's the other way. So in any case, let's do this. Uh, what's important is that I want to get the counts in. So here A is losing two and winning one, yeah? Okay, so the incoming arrow indicates a win. So B is winning two, D is winning one, C is winning two. And this is the remaining, okay. So this is sort of the situation. Um, so these wins and losses, uh, can you convert them, can you convert this information into some sort of a score and come up with a voting rule based on that? Okay, so wins minus losses. Right? So for every candidate, count the number of candidates that she is beating versus the number of candidates against whom she is losing and that difference is the Copeland score of the candidate. So 
So is Copeland a Condorcet consistent rule? I mean, the rule is just this. You look at the majority graph and you do this wins minus losses information and then you choose the candidate that has the highest Copeland score. Uh, as you can see, uh, Copeland also may lead you to ties. Here, for instance, B and C share the same Copeland score. Uh, so you may have multiple candidates with the same Copeland score. That's already a bit of a uh, bit of an issue. Also, um, note that here every edge in this graph is actually a win or a loss. Although if your election consists of an even number of voters, it's conceivable that two candidates end up in a draw, right? We haven't looked at that, but you could have edges which are undirected, signifying that there is a draw. Um, so those, those are situations that we are not accounting for here, but you could easily adapt the Copeland score to account for draws. So wins minus losses already implicitly accounts for draws by saying that we will not count them, okay? Uh, but there's also the asymmetric Copeland score which only counts the wins, for instance. And again, it's an easy exercise to check that all of these variations of Copeland will eventually output the same winner because it's essentially off by the, it's, I mean, they're all kind of related linearly in a fashion that doesn't change the relative ordering of the candidates. So we might as well just focus on the wins minus losses formula for Copeland. And the question was, is Copeland Condorcet consistent? Does the Copeland winner, if a Condorcet winner exists, does Copeland pick it? Yes, what is the Copeland score of a Condorcet winner? The number of candidates minus one, right? Because a Condorcet winner, remember, beats everybody in pairwise elections. So the number of losses is zero and wins is every remaining candidate is a win. So that is M minus one. And that is the maximum possible Copeland score that anyone can have. If somebody has a Copeland score of M minus one, then every other candidate has a Copeland score of less than M minus one. Is that clear? Because if you have one person who beats everyone, then everyone has lost at least one of their pairwise contests. So they cannot have the maximum possible Copeland score. So if a Condorcet winner exists, she will also be the unique Copeland winner. But in the event that a Condorcet winner does not exist, so for instance here, I mean, we do have a majority cycle and it is rated differently by Copeland and so on. So there is, uh, so Co Copeland can do interesting things when Condorcet winners don't exist. Okay, so I promised you that I will allude to the issue of cheating uh, along the same lines that you have seen uh, in, in the context of matching. So let's, uh, let's just talk about this a bit. So again, I'll uh, outline an example for you. It's Okay, so while I'm writing this down, one quick question. So in plurality, so by manipulation, let's just, so again, there are probably multiple ways of cheating in, in an election. But for now, let's just say that a voter changes their ballot to suit themselves. Okay, so I, I have a truthful preference, which is my true ordering of the alternatives. But can I get the system or the mechanism to output a better alternative by submitting a fake preference, okay? So by changing, so it's very similar to what we were doing when we were cheating with regards to matching. So we submit a fake alternative, fake preference over the alternatives and try to persuade the mechanism into uh, giving us something that is better. So is it possible to manipulate plurality for instance? So. In plurality, remember that the mechanism does not even account for information that is beyond the top position. So what is the best that you can hope to do in plurality? So just intuitively, does it make sense to so, so let's say that the plurality winner, so in some abstract election, the plurality winner is A. 
and A is not, sorry, so A is not your favorite candidate. That's why you're even thinking of manipulating. If A was your top option, you wouldn't even bother, right? So if A was not your top candidate and somebody else was, um, so let's say your preference was B over C over A, and clearly A is not winning, what can you do? I mean, for, ex for example, so you cannot make B win by changing your preference. Is that clear? If, if you change your preference, if anything, you reduce B's plurality score, right? So you cannot make your favorite candidate win by changing your preference. So at best, what can you hope for? Yeah, so maybe you can make C win, which would still be something because you prefer C over A. So again, in plurality, there is only one manipulation strategy that makes sense, which is what? Yeah, just place C on the top because anything else that you do will not change C's plurality score. But by placing C on the top, can you, for example, decrease A's plurality score? A's plurality score does not change because of your manipulating your vote, right? So A has the same plurality score. So the best that you can hope to do is to increase C's plurality score by one, which means that if you were in this precarious situation that A's plurality score is maybe, you know, maybe it's a very closely fought contest with C and A's plurality score is exactly one more than C's plurality score, then with your manipulation, what you can do is you can bring you can bring C to a point where it ties with you, right? And then you kind of hope that there is a tie-breaking mechanism that favors C. But you cannot you cannot guarantee or you cannot make C the unique plurality winner uh, by manipulating your vote alone. Okay, so a single voter manipulation is pretty limited in the context of plurality, but Okay, so you could do, you could, you could get your favorite, not your favorite candidate, but you could get a better candidate to tie with the current winner, or you could try to convince some of your friends to manipulate along with you, and then probably you can actually change the situation quite a bit. Okay. So that is called coalitional manipulation, but for now let me just continue to focus on uh, single voter manipulation. So. Uh, so here, let me just write down. So if I so for this election, um, what I wanted to do was work out the Copeland scores. Um, so I have the majority graph, but in the interest of time, let me just write down the Copeland scores directly. So B has a Copeland score of minus 2 and E has a Copeland score of plus 2 and everyone else has a Copeland score of 0. Okay. So what I'm asking is, is Copeland vulnerable to this kind of manipulative behavior? So is it possible for, uh, for somebody to misrepresent their vote and actually get a better outcome? So maybe let me actually draw the... majority graph here.
So AC and B all have a Copeland score of 0 which is to say that they win 2 and they lose 2 of their pairwise elections. Uh, B has a Copeland score of minus 2 and E has a Copeland score of plus 2. Uh, this is because if you look at um, if you look at E, so the notation here is that between A and B, A, A wins over B, um, okay, so 4 voters prefer A to B and 3 voters prefer E to A, uh, B to A, sorry. So between A and C, 2 voters prefer A over C and the remaining 5 voters prefer C over A, okay. So that's the, uh, that's the notation here. Uh, so if you look at E, uh, E is winning against A, E is winning against B and against C and it's losing to D. So it has essentially a Copeland score of 3 minus 1. So remember that Copeland is wins minus losses, right? So, so E wins 3 of its pairwise elections and loses 1. And if you look at the last two voters whose vote is A, B, C, D, E, for them this is a bad situation. Why? Yeah, E is their least preferred candidate and E is winning the election, right? So is it possible for one of these voters to change their vote and affect the outcome of the election for the better? Any different outcome will be good for them because E is their least preferred candidate. So even if you can get D to win, that will be better than the current situation. So is it possible to influence the outcome of this election by changing one of the last two votes, for instance? Okay, so so I'm going to request that we focus on single voter manipulation, um, meaning that maybe one of these voters comes away to change their vote. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll come back to you know both of them colluding to manipulate. Uh, that that will uh, clearly that will have a greater impact because you can do you have more leeway to do things. But what if one of them changed, decided to submit a false preference? How much damage can they do in terms of changing the outcome of the election? So let's just think about if we can make D win because I've looked at the example before you have so I know that that's something that is possible to do. Uh, so let's look at the scores for D. So D is losing to A and D is losing, um, is losing to C but is winning against B and winning against, um, is winning against D. And notice that the wins against B and E are with a decent margin, meaning uh, it is 5 to 2, right? So D has 5 voters preferring it over, meaning that there is some leeway. Even if, even if D loses one of its votes the other way, even then D will continue to dominate these two pairwise contests because there is some margin. On the other hand, where D is losing to A and C, these are closely fought elections. This is 4, 3 which means A has 4 voters preferring it over D and there are 3 voters who prefer D over A. So a switch here would actually make uh, D uh, fare much better. So and notice that if only one voter is manipulating what is their extent of influence on these pairwise elections? Can they make it like can they make a I don't know yeah so you cannot make a 2020 go to 
you know, 1525 by just changing your vote. Your vote is just going to have the influence of at most one flip. Either your pairwise preference stays the same, in which case that contest is not affected at all, or it goes from being like this to, you know, you shave off one from here and you increase this by one. That's, that's the extent of influence that you can have by changing one vote. So it's, an election is not closely contested, you are not going to actually change the outcome. So in fact, the good outcomes for B and D, you are not going to run the risk of destroying them because the margin there is, there is a lot of cushioning. So, it's, so you, you don't run the risk of making it worse for D. But on the other hand, you have the scope for improving the closely contested elections with A and C. So how do you think you can change this vote to actually execute this plan? Right, let's just keep D in the first place. And I guess it doesn't even matter what you do to the rest. So um, if you keep D in the first place, the, the fate here is going to flip. So previously what was happening was that D was losing to E, uh, sorry, D was losing to A, B and C in the original vote, right, because you placed D fourth. So D was losing to A, B and C. So as far as A and C in particular are concerned, because of this flip, uh, these fates are going to change. So this 4, 3 will become now 3, 4, right? So because A has lost one of its supporters relative to D, and similarly, C has also lost one of its supporters relative to D. So the 4, 3 again for CD also becomes 3, 4. The other two elections only improve or stay the same by putting D on top, okay? So this is one way in which you can in fact improve the, uh, you can in fact improve the score of D, uh, the Copeland score of D from 0 to So, um, okay, so are you ending up with a tie? Do we have, so 3 plus 2, 5. So we have 7 voters, right? So you should not have a tie. So will you end up with a tie anywhere? So with B and D, um, between B and D it will become 3, 4, right? And D is still winning. And between D and E again, it will be uh, it will be the same five comma two because D was anyway doing better, right? So the Copeland score is in fact four because now D is winning all the pairwise contests, right? Which in fact upgrades D to the level of not only a Copeland winner but even a Condorcet winner because there are now uh, four alternatives and D is beating all of them. And um, you can check that this is one way of manipulating. Even if you flip the order, you will achieve the same effect. So if instead of A, B, C, D, E, you submit E, D, C, B, A, that will work as well. Because as I said, there E is doing better than D, but this election has enough cushioning, so it will not affect that election. Um, and there are probably other ways that you can manipulate as well. So there are in fact multiple ways that this voter can change her preference to improve the outcome of the election with respect to their true preferences, right? So D was preferred over E in the true preference and so you could subject Copeland to this kind of, uh, you know, uh, to this, this kind of manipulative attack. Uh, so this is just to say that voting mechanisms can be vulnerable to cheating. Uh, it is possible, which leads to two natural questions. And one is, can you design a voting mechanism which is robust to this kind of cheating? Can it be built into the mechanism itself? Can the mechanism be cognizant that voters may be unscrupulous and therefore we should design the rule to kind of circumvent it? And to some extent, plurality is like that, but it does that at a very large cost. And it also does not necessarily protect you from coalitional manipulation where multiple voters may collude. And the other issue is from the point of view of the manipulator, we had an ad hoc procedure to discover that you can manipulate. But given an election instance and given that you want to manipulate, how do you figure out a manipulating strategy? That's the same question that you addressed for 
uh, matchings as well. And that's the same question that comes up here. And of course, the manipulation strategy will have to, the answer to that question will be closely tied to the mechanism that is in place. So it turns out that some mechanisms are easier to manipulate from a computational perspective, meaning that you can come up with efficient algorithms for figuring out a manipulation strategy, whereas there are other mechanisms which turn out to be a little harder or less obvious to manipulate algorithmically. So, um, so essentially these two questions lead to two different perspectives on the problem. The first question where we said, can the mechanism itself be robust to manipulation? Can we build it into the mechanism so that voters naturally have no incentive to cheat? That is, a, uh, that is what one might call an axiomatic perspective. You are saying that this is a desirable property of a voting mechanism, that it should not be vulnerable to manipulative attack. And can we come up with a voting rule that has this desirable property, among others? So the axiomatic perspective basically says that here are a bunch of properties that we would like our mechanisms to exhibit. So for instance, suppose the mechanism is uh, spewing out a ranking rather than a winner, right? So we said that we may want to output a ranking which reflects the societal consensus. Then you might want to say, things like if every one of you prefer A over B, then in the output ranking also we should rank A above B. It doesn't make sense to not respect a unanimous decision, right? So if everyone likes A over B, then the output should also like A over B. So that's an example of a desirable property. And there are many such natural properties that you could come up with that you say that a voting mechanism should respect. And uh, uh, non-vulnerability, meaning not being vulnerable to manipulative attacks is one such property. And the question therein becomes, well, can you satisfy, uh, can you satisfy a few natural properties together along with non-manipulability? So that's one sort of question which unfortunately turns out to have a somewhat negative answer. And we will, uh, we will try to formalize this more uh, in due course. But the other question which takes a slightly computational point of view where you say, okay, I mean, maybe the mechanism itself cannot be hardwired to avoid manipulation, but perhaps we can, perhaps we can discover that it is not easy for a manipulator to find a manipulative strategy, right? Maybe it is computationally challenging, in which case it is as good as practically infeasible. So that is a line of thought that has been scattered across several recent papers. But that's a line of thought that's also been severely debated because uh, you could theoretically establish the hardness, the computational hardness of manipulation, but it's still possible that you can try some ad hoc strategies like we've been doing and that heuristics work well in practice. So, uh, so it's a very interesting debate and it applies not only to the manipulation problem the way that I've stated it, but it also applies to other forms of doing uh, undesirable things like control, which we alluded to in the beginning, control by deleting voters, deleting candidates, and other forms of control. So these are all interesting strategic issues that come up. And we will be focusing a little more on the computational view as opposed to the axiomatic view, but we will at least state the theorems that are known in the axiomatic world, which motivate the computational investigation. So that is sort of the plan for much of what we will do tomorrow.